Very good to see you. I want to turn your neighbor and let them know how good looking they are today. I want to get everyone woke up. I know it's been a long Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a long New Year's. And it's time to get focused. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. We're going to open up in prayer today. God, we thank you so much for this day and for your love for us. I thank you for all the many blessings you poured out on us last year. For many people, Lord, who made a decision for you and came to know you as their Lord and Savior, we thank you for the work you did through this church and in our lives. We thank you for all the ways you provided for each one of us and kept us safe. We thank you so much for all of your blessings, for all you've given us. We pray for this year ahead that you would fill our hearts with expectations of you doing even more for us. Help us to draw closer and closer to you, to completely consecrate this next year to you, to devote it to you completely, so that you can do even greater things with us. Lord, I pray you'd help us to realize that all time is in your hands. We don't get to choose how long we get to stay here. I pray that you would fill us with the realization that life is short. And that we should not waste it on anything but living for you and knowing you and doing your work. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want you to turn your Bibles to James chapter 4. Someone asked St. Francis of Assisi one day while he was in his garden hoeing the dirt. They went up to him and said, if you, had, if you had last year to do over again, what would you do different? And he said, I would do absolutely nothing different. I would do nothing different. And I would continue hoeing my garden if I knew the world was going to end tomorrow. That's a pretty confident thing to say. If you knew you could get last year back, how many different decisions would you make? You know, they say 2020, or hindsight is 2020. There's probably some things you would have done different. I probably would have not watched the game last night. That would have saved me a lot of headache and time. You can probably think of all kinds of little mistakes you made. Maybe you ran over a nail and you think, man, if I could have gone back and did that a little bit different. I remember watching a movie called Sliding Doors. It's about this girl that uh, gets on a subway and she just barely makes it before the door closes. And she gets on there and and this girl goes and, and... The movie splits into two tracks. One follows her life the way it would have been if she would have made it through the door. And then there's another track of the movie that shows her tripping and missing the door to the subway. And that track, the movie flips back and forth between the two, shows a series of disasters because she missed this train of horrible things that happened to her and how it affected her life years to come. And the track of her getting on that train shows all these wonderful things that happen by happenstance. You ever think of life like that? Well, what if this just would have happened this way? Or if this just would have happened this way? Boy, if that bad thing wouldn't have happened or if that bad stroke of luck wouldn't have happened, my whole life would be different. Now, I think it's easy for us to, to think of life like that sometimes. And there's a little bit of a danger in it, though, because sometimes we think life is kind of just up to fate. And you know that's not really a biblical way to look at life. When we look at what God says in the Word about our life and the everyday things that happen, we need to understand, first and foremost, he, He's in charge of everything. He's in control of everything. You know, nothing happens in your life that God doesn't let in your life. Nothing happens. Unless God allows that thing to happen. So how should we be looking at life? How should we look at this new year coming up? 
how do I get the most out of it? You know, in, in the Bible, probably the person that really strove to, to squeeze every second of every day out of his life was, was probably the Apostle Paul. And he said that he strived every day to reach forward. He pressed on and leaned in and went after every second. How do we live like that this next year? How many of you have made New Year's resolutions already? None of you? you we have one person that made it. You better not drop it or we're going to be 100%. 100% of our New Year's resolutions as a, as a church would be... Have you got, how many of you guys are ashamed that you made one? How many of you are too scared to make one? Is that what most of it is? Most of us are too scared? I can't believe only one person made New Year's. Well, you come and tell me what it is, and I'll keep track of you this year to make sure that you do it, okay? Because you're the only person in here. No one wants to get better than what they are right now. Is that you guys are, you guys are as good as you want to be? Is that what it is? That really kind of disturbs me as a pastor, guys. Just to let you know. Uh, Mark Twain said that New Year's is a time for us to, to make resolutions. And to think about our life, and then uh, tomorrow we can get back to paving the road to hell with them. <laughs> because hardly anybody keeps their New Year's resolutions. It's a hard thing to do. So I don't really want to really necessarily talk to you about New Year's resolutions. But I do want to talk to you about principles. Sounding really necessary, specific things uh, or what we need to guide our life. Sometimes we get hung up on one little thing and, and we miss the big picture. We think, oh, I need to quit doing this one little thing or, or start doing this one little thing here. And, and, and we'll miss a bunch of important things. And I want to look at some big things the Bible says about life. Some big things the Bible says about how to plan our life. And I want you to look at James chapter 4. James is talking to believers here, and he gives an illustration. He says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. But James says, Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it's a sin. I want you to know that doesn't sound like there's a lot there, but James said a mouthful about really goes in to planning our lives out. I want you to look at the first thing I want to talk to you about today. If you want to make the most out of this year and do it right. The first point is this, and if you're taking notes, the first point is put first things first. Put first things first. That's the first thing we've got to do. All of life is about priorities, everything. Everything in your life comes down to your priorities. What is important to you? What do you value? When I talk to people that are having problems, whatever the problem is, I usually try to narrow down what that person values the most. Because really, at the end of the day, the thing that you're doing shows what you value. And so sometimes our life gets out of whack because our values are backwards. Because we have a problem putting first things first. These men that James is talking about, I I, I believe that, you know, this is possibly a hypothetical uh, conversation that James is bringing up here, but he's probably thinking about specific Christians in this church that he's writing to. So he says, come now, listen. He's inviting them to listen to his argument. He's like, come now and listen to this, guys. There's those of you who say, hey, today or tomorrow we're going to go here and there. We're going to spend a year in this place and we're going to do business and we're going to make a profit. We're going to do well for ourselves. Does it sound like a conversation many of us have had maybe in our lives before? Is there anything explicitly sinful in the things that these guys are talking about? Does it sound like it? 
They didn't say, hey, let's go over to downtown and, and get smashed and, and, and join in some reverie with some people and vandalize some buildings. They're not planning on doing anything like that. Their plans sound pretty tame, don't they? Hey, let's go over here and do some business and make some money. It sounds like what all of us do. We plan to provide for our lives, right? Doesn't sound like anything sinful. But James here is saying there's something extremely wrong with the way that they're thinking. He points out something very serious. And it's a serious sin I believe a lot of Christians fall into. A lot of Christians fall into the sin. The thing that these men are doing is they're leaving out something extremely important. Extremely important. And it shows that their priorities are, priorities are completely wrong. The thing that they're doing is that in their thinking, they're completely leaving God out of the picture. Completely leaving Him out. They didn't mention God in any of their conversation. They said, we're going to go here, we're going to make some money. I'm going to be able to provide for my kids, put some shoes on their feet. Is there anything wrong with wanting to provide for your family? Or get ahead a little bit in life, maybe? No, there's not, not, not necessarily anything wrong with any of those things. But James pointed out something that shed light on the priorities that these men have. They were leaving God out of their thoughts and of their planning completely. They totally disregarded God's will for their lives. Now listen, I want you to understand. If you're a Christian, if you know Jesus Christ, you need to understand that when you disregard God's will, you're doing something that's very foolish. You're doing something that's empty. And you're doing something that's destructive. What are your plans for this year so far? Have you thought about them? When you think about your plans for this year, is God in your thoughts? Do you understand that this year belongs to Him? That you don't breathe in or out even one time unless God gives that breath to you? Every breath you take comes from Him. And we owe Him every second of it. So how do you plan your life without God if you're a Christian? It's completely backwards if you don't. James is saying here in this passage that it's a sin. It's not wrong to make plans. But you better have your priorities straight. Listen, I also want to say that it is a sin to leave God completely out of your thoughts. If you're a Christian, you would probably agree with me, right? But I don't want to say it's equally a sin. I don't know if there's a scale, but I would say it's also a sin. To just include God in your thoughts in a peripheral way. You know, we make our plans. You know, I... oh. Uh, when you're in high school, you think, you know, what are my plans? I'm going to graduate high school, try to get at least a, a, a 3.0 GPA, so maybe I can get to college, and, and, and I'll try to maybe get a student loan, and, and then I'll, uh, I'll go to college, uh, four-year college. I'll get out in six years, and then I'll, I'll try to get a job. And you try to plan your life out like that, right? And you'll say, well, you know what? I'll probably want to get married some. I, I want to marry a good guy, so I better get him. I, I, I'll get that guy in church. And I want to pick up a guy in a bar because that's not a good choice. I, I want to go, go to church and find a good Christian guy. And I'll go to church and, and you know, we'll have kids. And we'll take them to church on Sunday. And, 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 and you plan your whole life out. And you just kind of say, okay, God, here, here, sign my plans. I want you to approve my plans. God, bless my plans. And you think God's going to bless your plans and, and, and the future you have in your mind for your life because you just threw God in there somewhere. Now listen, that's better than leaving God completely out of your thoughts altogether. Okay? Because maybe you'll come to church and hear about how important it is to put God first in everything. But is God just supposed to have a little place in your life? If you really know Him, if you really know how great He is, you need to understand that the only way you can get the most out of life is to make Him everything. Is to give Him the whole thing. Is to say, God, I know everything's yours. Why am I just going to make you a part of it when, when you made the whole thing anyways? I want my life to belong completely to you. And so these men weren't even just including God in their plans a little bit and saying, here, God bless these plans. They were leaving him out of their thoughts altogether. Altogether. They were living the life of a practical atheist. And I want to tell you today, if you want to live your life like a practical atheist, go ahead and plan your year this year without seeking what God wants you to be doing, without saying what James says here in this passage below, they should have said, and pay very close attention to the difference 
because it's, it's the difference between a life that has meaning and, is, and a life that has no meaning and is completely wasted. And teenagers, I want you to listen to this particularly. Teenagers, young men and women, you need to understand the decisions you make right now are going to, they're going to decide whether your life has meaning and is useful and is blessed by God or whether you waste it. I can walk you around any town and show you people who waste their lives every single day because they leave God out of their lives and out of their thinking. These men did not put first things first. I like Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. You should know this verse. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things shall be added unto you. Remember what Jesus said about that? He was talking to the people. He's saying, you guys worry about what you're going to eat. You worry about what you're going to wear. You worry about how you're going to have a roof over your head. And Jesus said, quit worrying about that stuff. Listen, this, this is how you live your life. Put God first. Seek his righteousness. And God will provide all of those things. You don't have to worry, oh man, how am I going to feed my kids? How am I going to have enough money to pay this bill or that bill? Listen, if you're struggling in life with those things, one of the first things you need to look at is, am I, am I focused on God? Does my life really belong to Him? Is He in first place? Because if other areas of our life are out of whack, we need to go to that first all the time. Is God in His rightful place? Is God first? And that's what Jesus said needs to happen. If you want God to provide for you and take care of you, put Him first. Now listen, God loves you unconditionally. This is a great thing. You know what that means? He loves you no matter how much of a bozo or a clown or a mess up you are. And I'm so grateful to that. Because I would have no hope if God didn't love me unconditionally. There are a lot of things in life that are conditional. A lot of, th- a lot of promises in the Bible are conditional. This is one of them. If you put God first, then you can know that God's going to take care of everything you need. It's an if. It's not, it's not promised unconditionally to everybody. If you put God first, God will take it upon himself to meet all of your needs, to take care of everything that you need. He will do that. But sometimes we don't have first things first, and so our life gets out of whack. God needs to be the engine that pulls the train. If you have any other motive pulling the train, your life's going to be out of whack. I want you to look at this verse again. He says, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year and engage in business and make a profit. And it almost makes it sound like when you read this passage that making plans is a sinful thing. And I don't think that either. God isn't saying that making plans is a sinful thing. The Apostle Paul made plans. He had plans to go to this city and that city and preach the gospel. And it's not a bad thing to make plans. It's not a bad thing to be self-disciplined, to think about the future. I think those are things that a very effective people do. The problem is these people made plans without God. Now listen, if you're a Christian, God wants us to make plans. I think that's good. He wants us to have goals as long as they're His goals. And the kind of plans God wants you to have, and I think this is true for every believer, I believe that God wants us to make big plans. He wants us to dream big. He really does. Uh, The Bible says, according to your faith, it will be done for you. It will be done according to your faith. What do you really believe God for? How do you believe God can really use you? Do you think He can do something with you? Do you think He can make this year worth something, mean something? Do you think He can show you things this year that you've never seen before? To know more about Him? To grow deeper with Him? We should be able to dream big as Christians. In verse 15, it says that we ought to submit to the Lord's plan, right? So he's not saying don't have big dreams, but just make sure your dreams are God's dreams for you. Because when you sign up for his dreams, you know it's going to come to pass, and you know it's going to be the best thing. Listen, the Bible says that God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Think about that for a minute. If you have a problem trusting God with your life, because you think, oh man, I don't know, I've got this plan here, and I don't know if God can outdo that. I don't know if God can one-up me here. I've got the best thing going. Oh, you're a sucker. Because the Bible says God's thoughts are higher than your thoughts. God's ways are higher than your ways. 
God can do whatever in the world He wants with you. And if you trust Him, and you have faith in Him, and you choose to follow Him, He can do that. But you have to put Him first. We can dream big. His plan for us and for you is for you to have abundant life. That's His plan for you. Jesus Christ came here that you can have abundant life. And if you're a Christian, if you're born again, you have access to that life. You have access to it. It doesn't mean you're living in it. That's conditional. Abundant life's conditional, living inside of it. You have access to it, but it doesn't mean you have it. What's a, what's a, what's a condition on it? It's a condition on you obeying. It's a condition on me saying, okay, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust you enough to say yes and do this. Right? God wants to see faith, which is shown by obedience. And so if I dream big, I can dream big dreams for Him. Because I'm following what He wants me to do in my life. The next point is this. The first thing was put first things first. And you're planning and you're thinking for, the, for this year. Put first things first. Don't just include God in your plans, though. Where does He have to be in your priority list? If you really want to see God do something in your life, if you want to see God provide for you, if you want to see God do big things for you, use you in an important way in the lives of other people, don't just include God in your plans. Put Him first. Say, God, I'm going out on a limb. And I'm going to trust you. I'm going to put you first. The second thing is this. Okay, life is short. Life's short. So, live for things that last. That's the second point. Live for things that last. There's a verse that says, Teach us to number our days that we might apply our hearts to wisdom. That's Psalm 90, verse 12. That's the Psalm Moses wrote at the end of his life. At the end of his life. He's asking God for wisdom. He doesn't have many years left, but he's asking God for wisdom anyways. I, I don't know, you got a couple years left to live, and I don't know how, how much longer he had when he wrote this. He was at the end, though. He said, uh, I want, help me apply my heart to wisdom. Teach me to number my days. Moses knew life was short. Every year you live is going to seem shorter than the next one, I guarantee it. Watching kids grow up seems like it's in fast forward when you look back on it. You think, how is this kid this tall already? How, how is this kid know enough information to smart off at me like that? How can they, they grew up so fast, right? Uh, but the years just seem to go by quicker every year. And there, there's a, a, a psychological uh, term for that. Uh, because the more you experience, it makes, I forgot how to explain it, but it's just a true thing. Every year we live seems shorter. But we need to understand that life's short. So if life's short, listen, what's important in life? So many people spend so much time living after things that don't even matter. They don't even matter. You can see everyone in the world going after things that aren't going to last, that aren't going to fulfill them. Listen to how we spend our time. This is going to make you sick. In an average person's life, 70 years, let's say 70 years is the average lifespan. If you live 70 years, you will spend 23 years sleeping. You will spend 16 years working. Eight years watching TV. Six years eating. Six years traveling, driving your car to work. 4.5 4.5 years in leisure, 4 years being sick, 2 years dressing yourself. I'm sure that's different between guys and girls. 0.5 years doing religious activity. That's the, that's the average. Someone did a study on that. Can you imagine that? It doesn't sound like you have much time to do anything important in there, does it? And because life is short and life is... It's chopped up into so many areas where we have to do things that you have to do. All right? you got to go to work. You do have to feed yourself. you got, you got to pay your bills or things that you have to do. So how do I prioritize the things in my life? How do I start to understand that all of life is a gift from God? We need to understand that, that those things aren't the things that really are going to last in life. The, the job and work-related ambitions that we have are only temporal and listen, I, I, I think it's wonderful to have Christians in, in every area of society. I'm glad we have nurses in this, in, in this church. We have people 
uh, uh, that, that run businesses and do all kinds of things. And that's the way it should be. Why? Because there's lots of people in, in all of these fields of life. And we need to be there telling people about Christ. But when Christians start to think that, you know what, my career is the number one thing. That starts to make your life go topsy-turvy. You're going to put your family in a place that they shouldn't be. You're going to put God in a place that He shouldn't be. Because you've got first things, you've got the first thing out of place. There was a, a magazine publisher who was interviewing this guy who was a, a, a he, he was a big health food nut, and he would go around and try to sell this health food, and he would be interviewed by people, and he would go on these talk shows. And he was seventy two years old, and he started he started saying uh, on this one tour he was going on of these talk shows that I'm seventy two and I'm going to live to hundred years old because I eat this food. And he went on a couple more shows like that and said that same thing. And then the next day, he died at the age of 72. He had all these plans for himself. And he wanted his career and boosting health food to go through the roof. He wanted to increase his portfolio. And just like that, he was dead. In 1923, I read about a planning meeting that was taking place between all the, uh, the country's top financiers in in, in, the, in, the, well, in the world even. And these people were the most successful people in the world at the, at the time. Those present were the president of the largest utility company, the president of the largest gas company, the greatest wheat speculator, the president of the New York Stock Exchange, a member of the president's cabinet, the greatest bear on Wall Street, the head of the world's greatest monopoly, and the president of the Bank of International Settlements. And there was this guy that wanted to see how these people's lives turned out, a researcher. And so he started following their lives and, and, and see what kind of paths that they would go down. And five years later, he came back with this. He said, the president of the steel company lived on borrowed money the last five years of his life and died bankrupt. The president of the greatest utility company died a fugitive from justice and penniless in a foreign land. The president of the, greatest, of the largest gas company was insane. The greatest wheat speculator died abroad, having no money. The president of the New York Stock Exchange was released from Sing Sing Penitentiary. The member of the president's cabinet was pardoned from prison so that he could die at home. The greatest bear on Wall Street died in a suicide, as did the man that had the greatest monopoly and the president of the Bank of International Settlements. They all took their own lives. All these people trying to get to the top and listen I believe God can bless you so that you can be successful. I believe he can bless you so that you can even be rich. Uh, God can do whatever he wants. I, I believe uh, God, can, uh, God has his rich people in this world. He has his, his Christians in this world that, that he gives the ability to make money because he knows they're going to use it for him. There, there are people that God can bless like that. Money is not a thing to God. You know, uh, to him, a penny is like $1,000 and $1,000 is like a penny. Right? Just the same way that a year is, or a thousand years is, is like a day to God and a day is like a thousand years. Money doesn't mean anything. The Bible says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. But the problem is when we start loving success more than God, then you're going downhill. And these men wasted their lives chasing loving success more than anything. There's nothing wrong with success in and of itself. There's nothing wrong with being well to do in and of itself. There is something wrong when you get your life out of a whack, when you say, you know what? My priorities are going to be me chasing after this thing. Success is first. So we need to understand life is short. If you live for the wrong things, you're going to waste your life. Waste it. Every year you live not going after God, not putting Him first, is wasting the very short and precious life that you have. Life's a gift. Don't trample on it. Don't throw it down the drain going after things that don't matter. C.S. Lewis wrote this. He said, If you read history, you will find out that the Christians who did the most for the present world were the ones who thought the most of the next. How much do you think of the next world? How much do you think of it? Do you think the next world is even real? I think a lot of Christians don't live like it is. A lot of Christians don't live like heaven is real, and they don't live like hell is real either. We only think about this life. Our plans only have to do with getting us by for this next year. Get me by for the next month. That's all we think about. We don't think about eternity. You know, you have people around you that are going to go to one place or the other. 
How much time do we spend reaching them? How much time do we spend letting God use us? Live for the things that really matter. The only thing that are going to leave this world are the souls of every single person that's ever lived. And God's word, God's truth is going to last. Nothing else is eternal on this planet except for those two things. And we live so much of our, of our time doing all these things. Yes, some of them we have to do, but we prioritize them and we focus just on those. And, and we leave God out of the picture and, and we, we just make our own plans. We don't even say, God, what, what am I here for? Don't waste your life living for things that don't matter at all. The next thing is this. Don't hang on to things so tight that you won't let go. In verse 14 it says, Yes, you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. Responding to these guys who are making plans without God. You don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. You're just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Vanishes away. I want you to think of when you're going to die. Let's say it's 70 years from now. Let's say it's 10 years from now. You don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen. But I want you to think about that day laying on your deathbed. The last thoughts you have to think. (coughs) Lucid thoughts about the life you've lived. Are you going to be able to look back and say, I I, I lived my life for some things that counted. For some things that mattered. I lived my life for things that would last beyond me. I think those are thoughts we all need to think about ourselves. I heard that Alexander the Great, one of the things that drove him was the way he thought about life because he knew life was short. And he had one of his generals every morning when he woke up, he said, the first thing I want you to tell me is that life is short. You'll likely die today. Make the most of it. And that's what his general told him. He lived every day of his life expecting to die that day, which was always a very likely thing for him. And he lived his life to his full potential as a conquering murderer. But he conquered most of the world, right? (laughs) He accomplished a lot because he understood. Life's short. I'm going to do something with mine. Most, Most people go through their whole life without accomplishing anything. And so you know what? When we put God first, we understand life is short. That is a gift. We won't be living like that. When we hang on to the things that are unimportant. Sometimes you can't get the things that are important. You ever hear of how they catch monkeys in, uh, in South America? They'll, they'll take a coconut. I don't know if I've told this before. I love this story. I don't know why. I'm sick. That's why. They take a coconut and they, 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 they tie it to a tree. And then they drill a little hole in the coconut. And they'll put, they'll put nuts and all other goodies that the monkey likes inside of the coconut. And the, the, the monkey goes crazy after it. And he goes up to that coconut he sticks his fist inside of that coconut and grabs those nuts and makes a fist. And then, and then when the, the hunters come with their clubs to club the monkey to death. Sorry, honey. The monkey tries to pull away. But he can't because he's made a fist inside of the coconut. And the, the hunters with the clubs come closer and closer and closer and closer. But he loves his goodies so much, he won't let go of it no matter what. And so he sits, there and, and he sits there and gets clubbed to death, holding on to his goodies. I think a lot of people live their lives like that. We want to hold on to our goodies. But we don't even really care what life is about. Right? We care for the little things in life and not the things that are great. Listen, God has great things for you. He has the best things for you. Why do you think you can outdo God? He says it's a sin if you do. It's a sin to play in your life like that. Don't think you can outplay in Him or outdo Him. Don't think you can outbless your life. You can't outbless God. You can't outplay Him. I have a Bible teacher that I loved a lot at, at Cedarville University. He was, a, um, he was our, our wisdom lit uh, Bible teacher, and he'd take us through. Uh, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Proverbs, and, and, and Psalms. and uh, He was telling us the story of when he was uh, taking his children on a hiking trip, and, and he'd been up this mount before he knew that the view was just outstanding. It was breathtaking. And, and he had looked so forward so long for his kids to see this view. Uh, and then they were just little guys. They were from anywhere from like 7 to, to 13. And, and he, he just 
wanted them to see this because it just impacted his life so much. And he, he would take them on this trip, and they were following him, and, and they'd start going up the hill, and, you know, they'd start getting tired, and he'd encourage them, and, and, and you know, kick them in the, in the chest a little bit to get them moving. And, 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 and every once in a while, they, they'd come across a puddle, and these kids would, would go jump in the puddle and play around and, and play in the leaves or whatever they could find. And he couldn't get their focus uh, on the things ahead. He, they just kept stopping in the puddles and playing in the mud. You see, you guys got to get out of the mud. You're not going to get to the view. That's why we're here. That's why we're on this journey, to get up there so you can see. And so they'd be like, okay, Dad, okay, Dad. And they come up to the next puddle, and same thing. They just, they just keep getting distracted and, and pulled away. And he looked at all of us Bible students. And he said, a lot of us live our lives like that. A lot of you do, too. You get distracted by things that don't matter. They're not even necessarily sinful things. They're just things that don't matter. And you spend and waste your life on all those things that don't matter. You're wasting your time here at school not doing anything for God. Because you're spending your time and your life on things that don't matter. And you're not going to get to the summit. You're not going to see the view because you're spending your life piddling around in a puddle. Instead of doing what God wants you to do with your life. Are you doing something important with your life? God's called you to do something important with your life. Don't waste your life. He has a purpose and a plan for you right here. In Logan, right here where you're at, he has a calling for you. But you can't play around in the puddles if you're going to do something important for God. Don't hang on to things so tight that you won't let them go. The next thing is we need to expect that temptation is going to come and know beforehand what you're going to do. Guys, listen, all of us this year, we're all going to face temptations. Everyone in this world faces temptations. In Corinthians, Paul says that temptation is common to man. Everybody's tempted to get off of God's path for their life. That's a very dangerous thing when you get off God's path for your life. There's a lot of illustrations and stories about paths in the Bible. And, and there's only one path that usually leads to the good stuff. And it's a very narrow path. And, and there's a lot of distractions to get off of it. It's a very broad path that leads to emptiness and destruction. Your life is a path. What path are you going to be on? You need to choose what path you're going to be on. And you need to understand that there's temptations left and right. Left and right, people choose all kinds of temptations. You know what your weaknesses are. But if you're going to be successful and stay on God's path this year, you need to understand the temptations going to come. Listen to what James says. He said, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord's will, in verse 15, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this and that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. These people had come to a place in their mindset where their whole thinking was sinful. They were tempted into that by covetousness, by, by having desires for the wrong thing, by seeking after worldly stuff instead of including God in their lives. He says, therefore, who knows to do the right thing and does it not, to him it is sin. And so we know we have sin all around us, tempting us to get off track. We know that what God's will is for us. He wants us to live righteous lives. He wants us to obey Him. He wants us to follow Him, to learn more about Him, to to seek after Him. We know the things we ought to do. So why is it that we don't do them? Well, Because we're weak. We're weak people. But we need to understand the only way to overcome temptation and focus on what God has for us is to focus on Him, to know Him personally, to get my strength from Him. But you've got to expect, especially, listen, if you try to start getting your life on track with God, oh, I'll tell you, the second you start to turn it around, boy, that's when the devil hits you. That's when the devil hits you. Whenever someone comes to Jesus Christ for the first, for the first time and they get saved, boy, I always warn them. I always warn them. Your life is probably... I can't tell you this for sure. I'm not a psychic or anything. But your life's probably going to get very rough for the next year. Even, I don't know how long. But the devil always tries to come after people who are trying to get their life right. To throw them off of course. As soon as you start to turn your life around. Even if you're a Christian that's just trying to leave a road of backsliding. Listen, the the second you try to turn your life around, the devil's going to come after you with everything he's got and try to wreck that. Because that is the last thing in the world the devil wants to see. 
Jesus said that the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. Do you think he doesn't pay attention when he sees you trying to get back on track with God? He doesn't want you blessed by God. And he doesn't want you being a testimony for him to the people down here. And so he's going to come after you all the time. And there's always going to be temptations. We've got to understand that this year. If we get on track with him, there's going to be temptations all around us on the left and on the right. Expect it to come and do what Daniel said. Daniel said he purposed in his heart not to sin against the Lord. He knew it was coming. Daniel was a teenager. Are you going to, say, are you going to tell me a teenager knows more than you? You should know temptations coming and purpose in your heart. Like Daniel did, not to sin against God. I am not going to defile myself. I'm not going to sin against God. There's a lot of sins that can wreak havoc on your life. Sometimes they're sins that only last a minute or two. But they can have a lifetime of consequences. Don't fall for the devil's tricks anymore. Listen, the last thing is this. James 4, 15 through 16. Listen, I love this. This says so much. If the Lord wills, this is what you should say. If the Lord wills, we will live and do this and that. That's what James says is the answer, guys. If the Lord wills, we will do this or that. What, what's he saying here? What's the, what's the key here? All right. Life is short, so we need to, to live it the most we got. Don't waste our life. Don't hang on the thing so tight we won't let go. Don't let temptation get me off track. And the next thing is get into the middle of God's will. Right in the middle of it. God has a will for you. This verse is so amazing. So many people think that God is, is, is impersonal. That he's up there and he's just a, a cosmic granddad or something that just spun the world and just watches us go our own way. That is not who God is. Some people think that God is just strict and, and waiting for you to trip up so he can smack you upside the head. Well, he does that sometimes, but it's not because he don't like you. But the Bible here says, this verse says so much. He says, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this and do that. This verse is saying that God has a will for you. He has a plan for you this year. He has things he wants you to accomplish. Listen, he has more than anything, a ministry for you. He has a ministry for you to accomplish for, for him and your family first and your church and the places that you go outside of this church, he has a ministry for you. What's your ministry? A ministry is being used by God to reach people. What's your ministry? Are you using it? Are you in it? Are you walking in the middle of God's will? What's he calling you to do? Were you wasting your life? Are you planning this year? Leaving God and his work for you out of your life? Are you putting first things first? This verse says that God has a plan. He has a will for your life. He has something He wants you to do. He has directions for you. And listen, it's a hard thing to go into a whole... I'm not going to go into a whole sermon about how God gives you directions, but if you don't want to miss anything in your life, the best thing you can do is get right in the middle of God's will. I always told teenagers, listen, if you want to marry the right person, I believe God has one person for you. He has one person for you, each one of you teenagers. And the only way for you not to miss that person is to get right in the middle of God's will. Say, God, I'm, I'm giving my life to you. I'm going to go the way you want me to. And, and God can make those dream matches come true. God's a great Cupid. He knows how to match you up. Why? Because if you get into the middle of God's will, do you think God doesn't know how to direct you? He knows how to direct you and everything in life. He knows how to get a hold of you. Do you trust him too? He has a plan and a will for your life. What's his will for you? Do you have any desire at all to have it? He's got something wonderful. If you're willing to let go of all the worldly, useless, peddly little things that the devil has to offer. Maybe they're not even sinful things. But maybe they are. And it's time to let go. And say, God, I want to follow you this year. I want to make a resolution to put you first. And not second or third or anything else. I'd like you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a minute.
New Year's resolutions can seem rough sometimes. I don't think I really make New Year's resolutions either. I'm reminded of a man that on New Year's Day was praying and said, Dear God, this day I haven't gossiped or or been angry or had any outbursts or thought any bad thoughts or, or lied to anybody or stolen from anybody or, or punched anyone in the face or murdered anybody. But in about two minutes here, I'm about to get out of bed and I'm going to need a lot more help. And we need a lot more help. We need to seek Him every single day. Are you ready? Are you ready to lay down the direction you've been going and to choose God's path for you? Because He has a path. And listen, you can't outdo it. You can't outbeat Him. You can't do better than what He has for you because He's smarter than you. He is better than you. And He is more powerful than you. And He can make whatever He has in His mind for you happen. I want you to stand... And as we pray...